Thank you. So we resolved one issue at last, at least for the day. And as we were talking about it, I'm working with LinkedIn from last one and a half year in the capacity of technical program manager and supporting the SRE org in the Bangalore. Let's try to the question in the room that what exactly a technical program manager has to offer at a SRE conference. And that's precisely why I would like, what I would like to answer, that what is the relevance and importance of a non-SRE in the world of SREs? How exactly I plan to do that is by using my topic that is evolution of LinkedIn SRE and how catalyzers help bend it. When we're talking about evolution of LinkedIn SREs, uh, I'll be talking about some time back, that is around 2010, and those who have been a part of SRECon in the past, they might have seen it sometimes back, but I'll just try to do a revamp for everyone. For those who have been here earlier, anybody recognize this pretty dog out here? Anybody knows him? It's a dog on fire. And that, that's what exactly was the situation we had in 2010. We were typically booted into the real model where we had classified teams that calls about systems, networks, DBAs. And to talk about SRE, we only had seven folks who were supporting the NOC, the site ops, who were supporting the release operations. And in total, we told as site operations team. Imagine those seven folks' life, and think about it when there are so many teams involved, how exactly they interact with each other. There was a heavy weight process around things. And there was a hero culture. Because when you're on fire, you need a savior all the times. And the savior is always coming out as a hero, and you need a hero on a day-to-day basis. There was a culture which was trusting, which was about trust between all these teams, within these teams as well. And this was creating a wall of frustration. Eventually, what was happening is for any deployed environment, nobody was acceptable for any change coming in with 100% trust. And that's how we had a dog who was on fire because there was a routine. There was an on-call which is so horrible that you feel that this is a part of life and you're just waiting for the hero to come back. In such times, organization realized that they cannot scale like this. You cannot work on an online system, the ever-changing environment around it, with the same model. They started measuring things up. How exactly my site is doing? What is my site up requirements right now? We used to have Monday to Wednesday, 8 AM peak traffic, and that used to result in capacity-related outages at the same time because of peak traffic. We had zero tolerance for application stacks, but near zero instrumentation to support it. And that time, that genie used to appear bi-weekly to say that we are having our downtime maintenance. And to think about it today, it definitely is not a good picture to look at. And that's when the knee of growth curve, as what we call it in the LinkedIn, it worked in 2010. That's why we specifically came to this part when we look back SRE was established. So if you think about it, between 2003 and 2010, we had one million member growth. It was growing, but it was not growing at the speed we would like to. But at the same time, we knew that things are changing. There is an interest in the market. We are expecting high growth, and we need something to support that. Since SRE was established in the last seven, eight years, we crossed five million mark in 2017, with 30% year-on-year growth. And SRE was a backbone to support that. Not just the growth, but the seven years of tech debt. And that says that I'm not saying it when I'm saying it right, that SRE are the backbone for all online systems. Then what is exactly the SRE at LinkedIn meant? SREs in LinkedIn behave across three core principles. The first one being site up. And I don't think so in this room, at least, I need to tell why exactly this is the first and foremost. You cannot have anything beyond this. If you don't have a site which is up, you have nothing to talk about. The second thing is empower your developer ownership. When we say developer, it's not just developer, but it's also all the partners we are talking about here. You should empower them to own the issues, to be able to rectify those issues. And operations doesn't need to be an operations problem. And that's where you need to give them self-service tooling and make them equally accountable. And in the same lines, 
Operations need not to be an engineering pro need not to be a hero culture, and it should be an engineering problem. Your issues should be like a software bug, which could be automated, which could be healed, which could be fixed. You don't need to look out for heroes every day. How those core principles help LinkedIn engineering? So what all we product companies do? We create magic. We bring features in the, in the market which people might never thought of. We help them do things they never even imagined. To create that magic, to make that magic happen, you need a solid base. It works on a function. It works on a foundation which is so firm and so solid that you do whatever over it, it works. And that foundation for us is the site up and secure. If your site is up, if it's a secure site, you can actually have the capability and flexibility to develop at scale, to develop technologies and scale, and to boost and rely upon those solid APIs and the building blocks over which you create those magic work. Right now, in four locations, we have SRE presence globally, Bangalore, New York, Sunnyvale, and San Francisco. And these, these SREs are composed of software, database, and infrastructure engineering journalists that make LinkedIn work. So this is our look back by now. Did anybody realize that I just called SRE journalist? And this is something I'm going to refer for the next, uh, next 20, 25 minutes. So why exactly I refer SREs as journalist? I would like to quote a Greek poet, Archelaus, out here. And he talked about two creatures, the fox and the hedgehogs. He said that the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And when I said that we are the journalist, SREs are the journalist, the idea to say was, metaphorically, we are the fox out here. We get input from multiple areas, and we get implemented at multiple areas. And these are the foxes, these are the SREs, who are spread horizontally. At the same time, there are hedgehogs in the system who are vertically defined, who are specialists in their areas, and who can work together, these foxes, and make, complete the picture and make it work even, even better. And these are the hedgehogs I would like to talk about today. These are the specialists, the catalysts I would like to talk about today. Okay. So for us, the SREs, they can be multiple catalysts in the system. And these catalysts, their power, their role, their impact depends upon how exactly a company or organization structure them. So it varies from their size, varies from their definition. To talk about a few of these, I will start with the first one, the folks who help you organize your time, the folks who help you execute your deliveries, the folks who actually align your deliverables with the company. Can anybody guess it? It's my personal favorite, by the way. <laughs> These are technical program managers. The second one being the UI UX designers. UI UX designers are not just the one who gives you a glossy look to your things. They're actually the people who understand how to get things done so that your users use it. A feature which is not easy to use is hardly used. So you need to understand the gap and create the right, the right flow, the right feature, so that it gets used accordingly. The third ones, your requirement gatherers, your technical writers, these are the folks who actually simplify the complex for you to your end audience and ensure whatever you want to deliver gets consumed accordingly. The fourth one, security. And I might expect certain people to feel, are they catalysts or are they blockers? Because whenever we go to them, these guys come back with certain expectations saying that do this, otherwise don't go live. But to think about it, if we work together, if you understand their requirements, they are the catalyst who are expecting us to build the user trust. In today's digital economy, you cannot flourish if you have user confidence. The fifth one could be the product managers, the one who knows the market, the one who can align your requirements, who can prioritize your requirements accordingly. And there are many. So these are a few catalysts I just listed out. And as I said, they vary as per the company. So in the in interest of time, I'll talk about two of them. So these two, specifically, uh, why exactly I'm talking about only two tech catalyzers out here? Because the, these two catalyzers stay common to all companies, irrespective of how you place them, how you define them. Because if they're utilized well, 
you can actually have a place where you complete the picture and ensures an effective SRE org. The two I'm going to talk about are technical program managers and security folks. I read it somewhere that when you're an SRE, you're supposed to be expecting the best, planning for the worst, and prepared to be surprised. Now, we expect whatever is expected, but how exactly we can deliver on this? That's where my first catalyzer, we, the technical program managers, come into the picture. I'm pretty much sure that we all have worked in the companies where this role is loosely defined, and the expectation says that these are the folks who capture minutes of meeting really well, or let them have the scheduling part done and, have, and manage the calendar well, or at times even the swags. And that's, that's come with everybody. So, but if your company is hiring your TPM like that, you're actually not doing justice to that, and you might not be able to utilize them in their best capacities. In that case, what you should expect out of your technical program managers? Expect your TPMs to be the partners and leaders in your organization who are completely vested and have 360-degree view of what is happening. Because these are the folks who are not only responsible or the guys who help you deliver or execute on the projects, but deliver and execute what is right, and execute it rightly. They align your work. And how they do that is your TPM should be a metric-oriented foe. They should depend on the data to identify the issues, to triage the issues, and to fix those issues. Just to let you know, there's a poll upcoming. So if all, all of you can go to slido.com and enter the event code hash x563. What exactly this poll is going to talk about? How many times we have felt that we are like this pendulum that keeps swinging between the planned and unplanned work, and mostly towards the planned work at times. I know that doesn't how the pendulum works, but our life works like that. To understand that and to understand the nerve of the, the audience out here, let's start with the poll. So the first question out there is, how much of your time is spent on interrupt-driven work? I'll give you some time to put your polls in. And we already have some answers coming in. And if you see, 50% is gaining the momentum, and it is getting 75% votes out of four. OK, and now there is a second question. How many of your ideas to improve the operability or resiliency of your services turn into project on your roadmaps? How many times you have felt that you have a thought, you had an idea, but it is not com com coming into a picture of your roadmap. It's always get deferred at times. And most of us are right now here feeling it's a struggle, but a few of them get implemented, or we can do that. Right now, only after an escalation, that's a good thing it's not coming up. And we can do that as also gaining momentum out of 17 votes. Coming towards the next question, which is on the same lines, it says that how often does your input on a project result in an action item? That is, you have feedback, something got over. You just told them that what should have been done better. How often you see that next time it's just implemented? And it's good to see there are folks with always. And in industry, how it works that it sometimes get done, or sometimes it just get captured and forgotten or become a learning for a future. So all these three questions tell us that we somewhere swing between ad hoc and unplanned work. Sometimes our feedback doesn't get heard the way we would like them to be. And sometimes we don't get the roadmap as we want it to be. So where does that lead us? That leads us to TPMs, again, as I said, the TPM should be a data-oriented folk. How exactly they can help you learn the data points? They start with digging the, the ground. The first level is the very basic level, and everybody knows about those questions. They try to understand the number and severity of incidents which are occurring over a month for a team. And these two has to go together. If you only rely upon numbers, they might not do the justice to the analysis. 
So you need to understand the severity of it and how exactly it's impacting the availability of your services. And then, are you walking over it? Or you have your capacity planning in place? Based on the answer to these basic questions, you get into the level two. How exactly is your on-call data looking right now? Is your on-call data doing justice or is there presumptuous data? Or is there facade in the data? How much of that work you're doing is planned or unplanned? Your planned work could be some issue which you fixed, you identified a week before as well. So how much is you able to you know, map your work with your day? And the third one would be about the craftsmanship. And your partner's craftsmanship. And that's where TPM again plays a role to understand the team's health. How exactly they can help you maintain a partner relationship and have a great health and you both are commonly focused towards the same goal. You're talking the same language. So I'll just narrate a personal experience to go through these points. So when I joined LinkedIn, uh, the first thing I was tasked to was to work with a team who recently joined the SRE part and they're having struggles, a lot of struggles. And not because they joined SRE, because their on-call was horrible that time. Everybody knew their problems. Everybody wanted to help them. Every single person wanted to help them. But nobody could find, picture the, where exactly the problem point is and where exactly they need to focus to find the solution. And that's where we started digging in. Where exactly the problem is. So I'll give you just an example. Their on-call data was like 400 alerts a day. But if you dig deeper and do some noise cleanup, you realize out of 400, maybe 100 were making impactful issues and others could be something which could be beyond on-call for that day. There was a noise cleanup required, they know about it, but they didn't have time to do that. So what we do? In LinkedIn, we have a practice of Coriolos, where we see if there are things which are going really bad and we need to fix it. We take a halt. Rather than going beyond a grading for the mess, we take a halt, we understand the issues, we involve our partners, we get the buy-in basis, the data, and approach towards a solution, defined solution, and exit criteria, which is measurable. And we hold for like a couple of weeks, we work together, and we come back with a clean slate. And that's what we did exactly. We got a buy-in, we were able to get our partners on the same ground. And there was a relationship between dev teams and the SRE teams, which was like they were able to understand the point points and were talking the same language. And this all could not have been possible if you don't dig through these questions. Now, what you should see is that this is a Johari window. And this is how every single project or developer works. There are always blind spots in the system. How these blind spots occur in the system is, whenever you come up with something, whenever you deliver something, there are things which are transparent and known to everybody. That these are the issues and you need to work on them. There are things which is known to your team, or maybe some other teams, but the idea is that maybe this is the way it is, or maybe I should I voice it, will it get heard, or maybe I can just have I can just live with it, so just let it be like this, that. And they don't voice it. There's a third way, that is blind area, where folks know about it, but they are so far apart. They are the users, they are like, again, they don't voice it, because they feel that they might not get heard. And then there are unknown zones, which is like not known to anybody out there. And a TPM helps you to bring these three zones become a transparent and known zone. How to do that? How to bring it here? This is where we appreciate and what works for us is feedback loop. You should not have your feedbacks towards the end of a project. You should not have it after the project is delivered as, a, as, a, as an exercise. You should have it as a part of your project. Whenever you have building a process, a project, or a tool, Start gathering the data. Start having the right audience in the place to give you the feedbacks. And in those feedbacks as well, you should have an iterative feedback loop of correction. So that even in the feedbacks, if you require something to be changed, you're doing it parallelly, rather than waiting for it to be too late to get implemented. There's a five-step plan to do that, and that really works for us. The first one says, approach the feedback. Know who are the right guys, the right stakeholders to give you that feedback. It could require a survey. It could require a meeting. It could require a one-on-one. -on -one. But know the audience who need to give you that feedback and reach out to them to gather that feedback. Once you have the feedback in place, there are chances that they are facade in that feedback. Because the moment when we start, uh, 
it goes into multiple horizons. So there could be a facade about it which is actually irrelevant. And there is a dig deep required beyond what is actually captured. So you need to work on that surface. You need to talk to the right folks. If you feel there is a facade, you need to call it out. You need to be transparent about it. And then you need to dig deeper. Out of the given feedback, which is now a massage feedback for you, you need to isolate the issue and triage that particular issue in the system. And when you're triaging your issue, you should know exactly who is going to cater it. So who is the audience who is going to get supported out of it? And then you come back with a solution for that. So when I say, so what exactly could be the takeaways for SRE from the first catalyst? Keep calm and trust your TPM. I know the trust has gained, but give them a chance to, to prove themselves and help them to help you. Second is what gets measured gets fixed. Don't shy away in measuring the data. Be visible, be transparent about it, because if you don't measure it, it will never, ever get fixed. It will always stay in the system as a problem. And as been quoted by David Henke, if you're not a part of solution, willingly or unwillingly, you're a part of the problem. So it's up to you where, where exactly you would like to be. On that note, I'll switch to the second catalyst. That is our security folks. Now, think about it. These guys are facing the same issues as you are facing as an SRE in the changing environments. In today's world, there are changes which is happening in production where they are ideated in the morning and they are implemented in the evening. And to maintain that kind of changes with tight sets of security, it's a task. How exactly a security folk should approach towards those particular changes? There should be a culture which is a culture between SRE and engineering teams of trust. You should trust them. You should tell them in the beginning what is expected out of them and verify whatever you expected them to do. But there should be that trust level expected between security and SREs. They should be open to each other. Embrace the error budget. You cannot ever shy away from that, that there would be no error budget. There will always be error budget. But there could be a way to deal with it. So that's why you need systems which are on such a robust, good known state that you can actually do the auto limitation when needed. You can do it, uh, you can actually implement self-healing processes and reduction of manual processes required when you want to talk about the error budget. And the third one is be true to yourself when you feel there are architecture changes which has reached a certain complexity point, call out a halt and try to review it or fix it before you move further. On the same lines, nowadays the centralized structure doesn't work in that much, as much as we want them to be, and there is a microservice architecture which is in place. And that microservice architecture is actually exploding, and it, to meet the scalable requirements, it creates a, a huge level of effort for SREs and securities together. So if SRE challenges are, they can have the latency and performance impact out of any changes coming into the microservice architecture, or there could be a cascading failure scenario, or there could be a discovery of a completely new service. Similarly, security has the same kind of threat going on, that how to authenticate all that, how to authorize all that. And there should be access control logic in place, ensuring that whatever is going into the system is not going to break anything security-wise. Now to think about it, we both are talking on the same lines. So is security a hedgehog or a fox? They are actually both because they're also horizontally spread, but for SREs right now, they are the hedgehogs. But if these two work together, they can ensure that the digital economy is in the safe hands. How to maintain that? How to do that? There should be a production access and change control process in place where it says, you should always start with a good known state. You should never ever have a state where you cannot come back to. You should have discipline across the asset management and change controls. And it's not something which is negotiable. You should always force on that. Visible, be visible, be transparent to each other, talk about the problems as much as you like them to get fixed. And keep constantly and consistently validating it rather than waiting for the last moment. And how to have a valid good known state? If you use your configuration as code. If you leverage the source code control paradigms, 
to come back and do the rollback ruthlessly, you'll be able to come to a good null state every time, and your system impact would not end up having an impact to end users. So from security, what could be the overall lessons for the SRE? Revolve, so whenever we talk about availability, we try to remove the single point of failures. Similarly, if you feel there is one particular point where too much of security flaws are pointing towards and failure of that would impact on the security, remove those points. In today's day and age, we cannot work with just an antivirus. There can be an attacker, there can be an issue anywhere in the system, in the flow. So always be cognizant of that. And always keep asking yourself, would that be a security threat in the future? And as I said, as a TPM as well, always capture and measure meaningful security telemetry. If you measure that, if you do that, you will always have data to understand where exactly failure happens and how exactly or how quickly you can resolve that. So I'll come to a halt here, and I'll just talk as a TPM on the ground that data-driven and being open to your problems will half, so resolve half your issues which you are facing right now. So what you, all you need to do is align with your catalyzers. I talked about five, six catalyzers. Whoever you feel are the most prominent ones for the use, align with them and let them help you. Don't uh, keep them out of the system. If you bring them in, they will give you some tremendous value out of it. They can help you reduce a lot of tech debt. To think about it, security has a vested interest. Because if you give them the tech debt, there could be gaps in security and they would like to fix that. Similarly, a TPM, before suggesting a process to how to move forward, they would like to have the ground which is actually firm. And for that, they need to clean that tech debt. They need to come out of the issues what you already are having there. So you always, always, always use your catalyzers and they will help you reduce your tech debt. They help you measure your data and isolate the issues. So though it's looking like it's a quick thing, but to get the measurement of data, you need to be having an unbiased approach towards it. Where you, you look into the data, you dig deep into the data, and you are good and open to talk about the issues. As said, that failing to plan is planning to fail. And I have heard it many times that people say planning doesn't work for us. But think about it, people go to war with a plan. And it can't be more ad hoc than that. And the last one says, Journalists will always need specialists and vice versa. And that's how we grow together, learn together, and create great organizations and great products. To that, I open the forum for the question and answers. And you can also reach me out at eigenerival at linkedin.com if you have any specific questions regarding TPMs.